so yeah, we introduced these generalized, well, I'm going to talk about generalized dietic systems later, these shifted dietic systems, the omega, they satisfy something which, which I usually refer to as a dyadic dichotomy. I forget whether this is actual terminology. It's one of these things I've just been using so long that I forget whether I came up with it or not. I probably didn't. I didn't come up with the concept, certainly just the name dyadic dichotomy is nice. Um, if you have two intervals in the system, so you have two intervals I and J in this shifted dyadic system, then I and J are either comparable, meaning that I is contained in J or J is contained in I. They're either comparable or disjoint. No third option, right? In general, if you have two intervals, well, intervals, hang on, this way. You can have two intervals such that they're not disjoint, but neither contains the other one. Like this, for example. They're not comparable, they're not disjoint. But when you look at intervals in a dyadic system, they're either disjoint or you have a comparison because one's actually strictly smaller than the other. Or one is strictly larger than the other if you do it the other way around. This is familiar with the standard dyadic system. You've probably used this before. It's also true for shifted dyadic systems because a shifted dyadic system you should think of as just the standard dyadic system, but shifted. You just have this technicality that when you look at larger intervals, maybe you're shifting them by different numbers. But in a sense, everything that's true for the standard dyadic system is true for shifted dyadic systems as well. Combinatorially, it's the same thing, right? So we're going to use this dyadic dichotomy a couple of times. It's probably the main thing that's actually used about dyadic intervals or shifted dyadic intervals. And it, yeah, it simplifies the analysis quite a bit. I'm not going to prove it. I think there's actually an exercise in the notes that you should prove this, so you should do that. The important proposition about translation invariance is that shifted dyadic systems are not actually translation invariant, but the set of shifted dyadic systems is translation invariant. So if you have one of these two-sided sequences omega, and if you have a translation parameter x in the real line, then if you take the omega shifted dyadic system and then you translate it by x, so you take every interval and you shift it by x, this is another shifted dyadic system for some other parameter omega prime. So this says that the set of shifted dyadic systems is translation invariant. This is how we manage to build in translation invariants to operators that don't actually have translation invariants. Well, this will lead to that anyway. So I was going to prove this before the break, but we didn't have time. And I'm wondering whether I should skip the proof. I don't think I will. We're going to do this proof. This proof's important enough. It gives you a bit of insight as to why the shifted dyadic systems are constructed in the way that they are. Also, I don't think I've actually done any proofs yet in this lecture, so I probably should do a proof. So let's take an interval i in the shifted dyadic system and we write it like this. It's two to the minus j times the interval k, k plus one for some integer k plus this number here, two to the minus i write a little bit neater, two to the minus i, omega i. Also for some scale j, because every interval in the shifted dyadic system has this form, right? And then let's consider the binary expansion of the number x. So we have this parameter x, makes sense to write it out as a binary expansion because everything here is really about binary expansions. Let's write it as 2 to the minus i eta i for some eta 
in this space. Of course, it's going to have only finitely many entries, but wait, no, you can have infinite expansions. <laughs> it might have infinitely many entries, of course. Anyway, uh, to one in one direction, it's going to be all zeros, and then the other direction is going to have whatever. It, this is not important. X has this form for some e to i's. Not even unique. That doesn't matter. We'll write that as two to the minus j sum over i two to the j minus i e to i, like we did earlier. And we're going to decompose that even further. We're going to separate i less than or equal to j and i greater than j, like that. And what you see here is that this number here, this is an integer because we always have two to the j minus i and j is greater than or equal to i. Is that right? Is it? Yep. And this here is going to be between zero and one. I don't think it's going to be equal to one. Uh, it could be equal to one. We're going to have integer plus something. That's what's important. Let's let k sub j be the integer k from up here that's determining what i is plus this integer here. So that this k sub j is also an integer. <coughs> so once we've made all these definitions, we can write i plus x so taking this representation of i from up here and taking the representation of x, we can write i plus x as two to the minus j times the integral from k sub j to k sub j plus one. And we have a remainder, which is the sum of i greater than j, two to the minus i omega i plus e to i. If you just do the, the math, Take the thing up here, add this to it, you get that. And we can write this as, well, the first term doesn't change, but the second term, let's write that as the sum of i greater than j of two to the minus i omega prime i, where we have this number omega prime. This is two-sided sequence of zeros and ones where this is, just for lack of a better way of describing it, this is the formal binary expansion. The formal binary expansion of the sum of the numbers with formal binary expansion formal binary expansions, omega and eta. Now, what I mean by that is you take sequences of zeros and, zeros and ones and you treat them like binary numbers. So you do the addition, but you carry the ones where you need to occasionally carry ones. And you don't care about any convergence or anything, just infinite. It's like formal power series addition, right? You don't, you just consider the thing formally, you do the carries where you have to do the carries and everything will work out fine. The thing is, of course, this omega i and eta i can both be one. Right, and you sum those up, you get a two. That's not allowed in a sequence of zeros and ones. So you do the whole carry the one, take it to the next entry thing. You do binary addition, right? And you just do that infinitely. Right. So what this says is that this interval here is actually contained in the shifted dyadic system, shifted by omega prime. Because you have here two to the minus j, you've got this integer k, k sub j, and then you've got this number here. So you, you do all of that right, and you get that the translation of this shifted dyadic system is contained in this other shifted dyadic system. And by symmetry of the argument, you have the reverse inclusion as well. And that is the whole proof. Basically, when you define it in this define way, this, sorry, but yeah. If we want to define this in the addition, wouldn't we have to have a point where we start and then like take 
take this this one's over you, because you are completely right about it, that you're completely right um it doesn't matter in this case because the number eta starts with a bunch of zeros so eta has the form zeros all the way to the left and then some non-zero stuff you're right like you, this formal thing doesn't work but because is this making sense I think if we wanted to do it real, really formally, we'd have to have zeros to the right somewhere. Uh, Maybe. And I guess otherwise you get the thing you also get with real numbers that 0.11111 is the same as 1.0. Yeah, I'm not being very careful. This is but, true. Um, I guess we to the right, we can just treat it as addition of reals and to the left we can just say there's zero somewhere and yeah, yeah, yeah. between the two it should somehow work out yeah this I proof hope. is slightly dodgy you, you need to try a little bit harder to make it work really rigorously let's put the quotes here as as i always do <laughs> and let's say this is not totally rigorous you need to be a bit more careful about what that addition is you're right you can arrange it such that you don't have this repeated ones to the right and then everything will be okay. The good thing is we don't actually need this proposition. <laughs> we don't ever use it. This is just to motivate the, the translation invariance. If you're not comfortable with this proof, pretend we didn't prove this proposition. It's okay because we're not going to use it. But this is the idea. This is the idea of the translation invariance of the set of dyadic systems, shifted dyadic systems. Or you can pretend we proved it properly. This is probably better. Okay, so we have shifted dyadic systems. They are translation invariant, or at least formally, in some sense, translation invariant. We also need some dilation invariance. So remember the Hilbert transform had this translation invariance and a dilation invariance and a reflection invariance. Um, I'm not actually going to talk about the reflection invariance. That's in the notes. These things are reflection invariant. That's not a problem. But for dilation invariance, we need to actually add an extra parameter. The problem is, if we take a shifted dyadic system, all of the intervals have length 2 to the minus j for some j. And if we dilate all the intervals by a small factor t that's slightly greater than 1, then all the lengths will be t times 2 to the minus j. And this is not going to be a shifted dyadic system anymore, <laughs> because t times 2 to the minus j is generally not 2 to the minus k for some k. Right? So we need to actually add in an extra parameter. So for omega as before, and for t greater than 0, we will define what we'll call a generalized dyadic system. I could call it a dilated shifted dyadic system, but that's a bit too confusing. T times the omega, which is just T times I for all I in D omega. That's the whole definition there. Just take your dyadic system. For all T greater zero, are you going to do for T between one and two should be enough, right? I'm going to restrict to T between one and two later on. Okay. Right. For this definition, any t will do. But yeah, you don't need all t's here. Because the next note, this is exactly what I'm going to say. <laughs> You've preempted the note. If t is greater than 0, and omega is as before, then it's always the case that this generalized dyadic system, t d omega, is actually t tilde d omega tilde for some t tilde between 1 and 2 and some other omega. So you actually only need to consider dilation factors between 1 and 2. This is, I guess, most obvious when you think of t as being a power of 2, because then you're just basically taking this parameter omega and shifting it to the left or right. You're basically replacing scales with larger or smaller scales. That's all that's happening there. But yeah, in general, t between 1 and 2 is sufficient here. And this is going to be good for us because we're going to just take a probability measure on the interval from 1 to 2. We didn't, we've, 
we had the problem with the real line that we couldn't take a nice probability measure on it that was translation invariant, but on the interval one, two, we sort of can. It's not gonna be Lebesgue measure. This is the thing. It's gonna be DT on T. We'll come back to that. Yeah, so we need to only consider T between one and two because we can have an arbitrary translation parameter omega. The other note is that generalized dyadic systems have all the properties of the standard dyadic system, just shifted and translated. So this thing about this dyadic dichotomy, two intervals are either comparable or disjoint, the same is true for generalized dyadic systems, right? Yeah, that's all I have to say about that. It's all very simple. We don't need to prove that. So the key idea, which I've sort of described partially, is that we will take the product probability measure on our set of omegas. So each factor's got the uniform probability measure. And we'll take some probability measure, uh, eta on the interval from one to two. Uh, we don't actually have to take a translation invariant one. We're gonna take two different choices of eta that will give us useful operators. So we'll take some probability measure eta. Then you get a probability measure on the product of these two spaces. This gets a probability measure. Let's call this measure P, the one on the product of zero and one. Let's get a probability measure nu cross P, which lets us choose a random dyadic system. or a random generalized dyadic system, I should say. So you take a random translation parameter and a random dilation parameter and you get a random dyadic system. And these will let you take Martingale transforms or things that are like Martingale transforms with respect to a certain random dyadic filtration. These, yeah, so we get a random dyadic system. This leads to random Martingale transforms. which will be bounded when we take UMD spaces. And this then lets you take average Martingale transforms. Where for every parameter in the probability space, you take a Martingale transform and then you average over all of those choices. And these will give you some bounded operators and these bounded operators will have certain translation and dilation invariances and you will get the Hilbert transform in this way, or at least you'll get the truncated Hilbert transforms like this. And this is how we're gonna prove boundedness of truncated Hilbert transforms, by constructing the right random Martingale transforms and then computing that their average actually gives you the truncated Hilbert transforms up to some error terms that we're then gonna bound. That's a sketch. Right. So one of the problems that we've run into now is that all of the theory that we developed in the last weeks was for probability spaces and martingales on probability spaces and filtrations and things. And now we're working on the real line, which is not a probability space. And we have all these filtrations and things lying around. We have dyadic systems, but none of these are on probability spaces. And we could have actually done all of the probabilistic theory from the beginning on sigma finite measure spaces rather than on probability spaces. And everything still would have worked. We could have dealt with arbitrary sigma finite measure spaces and Z indexed martingales. So two-sided martingales and everything would have worked. And if we'd done that, I could have just said theorem, these operators are bounded, but we didn't do it that way because I wanted to keep everything probabilistic up until it didn't have to be. So now we just need to do a, a short reduction that takes us to the probabilistic setting and lets us use the bounds we've 
you know, proven there, even though we're on the real line. So let's do this proposition here. Do I have time? I hope so. Okay, take X to be a UMD space. Take P between one and infinity. Then for all, oh, hang on. I'm looking at the wrong proposition here. I'm still, I still have to do something on probability spaces before we can go to non-probability spaces. We're returning to Hardy compositions. I was jumping ahead of myself there when I started talking about the real line. We have to say one more thing about Hardy compositions on the unit interval before we can go to the real line. For all F, it's LP on the unit interval. So in the last lecture, before the break, we proved a couple of things about Hardy compositions, just as a consequence of bounds for Martingale transforms. I'm going to remind you what we did, or at least I'm going to remind you of a result. Uh, the LP norm of F is equivalent up to a constant, depending on P and X, to the Rademacher average, where you take a Rademacher variable, just in this epsilon null set, it's just an indexing, it's a Rademacher variable times the average of F, plus the sum over all standard dyadic subintervals of the unit interval. Rademacher variable, half function, tensor with half coefficient F integrated against that half function. And incidentally, this is equal to a Rademacher average with a different Rademacher sequence indexed differently. I'll write it out and then we'll just discuss the significance of it. So what's happening here? This is saying that you can recover the LP norm of a function by taking a Rademacher average over its Haar representation. And we have two different Rademacher sequences here. One is called epsilon, one is called epsilon tilde. And the point of this result, well, there's two points. One is that the LP norm is equivalent to a Rademacher average. The other is that you can take that average indexed over the set of all dyadic intervals or over the set of all scales. Because here, the Rademacher, the Rademacher variables are indexed by all intervals and here, just the lengths of the intervals. So if you have two intervals with the same length, then you have the same Rademacher variable associated with each of them. So this is really a fully random sign in this first term. In the second term, you have random signs, but the signs are associated with the lengths, if that makes sense. I hope it does. Maybe it makes more sense when I show you the proof. So the key thing we have to recall is that higher expansions are just Martingale difference representations. So you have that this higher expansion This is the higher expansion of F. You can write that as a Martingale difference DF zero plus the sum over N from one to infinity of DFN. This first term here is the, the zeroth Martingale difference. These are all the other ones where the N is indexing in the scales. So N is corresponding to scale two to the minus N. This uh, here F dot is the, the Martingale associated with F and the dyadic filtration and DF dot is the Martingale difference of that. So by Burkholder's inequalities, that says that the, the LP norm of a function is given by a Rademacher average of the Martingale difference sequence. Burkholder's inequalities say that LP norm of F is equivalent up to a constant depending on P and X, equivalent to this Rademacher average here. That's Burkholder's inequalities, if you've forgotten that. And using this representation of the, the Hardy composition, this is 
this writer marker average here. Let's put an epsilon tilde just to actually no, no epsilon tilde, that's going to be more confusing. Let's write it like this. Uh, Yeah, the problem is that the um, the way that the writer marker variables is indexed is a bit confusing here. I'm just indexing it in two different ways. Here I'm taking epsilon n for every natural number n, and here I'm taking epsilon length i for every length of i that occurs here. The lengths of i are two to the minus j for every integer j, and I'm just re-indexing the sequence. The point is that here I have a writer marker variable for each n, and here I have a writer marker variable for each scale. These things are in bijective correspondence here. So there's one other inequality, or one other equality we need to prove. We need to prove that, just looking at the top here, this Rada marker average is equal to the other Rada marker average, the one where we have a Rada marker variable for every interval rather than one for every scale. So for the remaining equality, Let's take this writer marker average indexed by all of the intervals. Yep, HI tensor R coefficient. So we have the Kahan Kinchin inequality. which says that this writer marker average can be replaced by a writer marker LP average. And then we can do some Fabini. You've seen this trick before. This is equivalent to the integral from zero to one of the writer marker average, which I'll write out. So now we evaluate this at, yep, X. So this is just Gahan, Kinchin, and Fabini. I think you've seen this before. And now let's look at what's on the inside of this integral here. And we'll notice that for every x between zero and one, there exists a unique, oh, sorry, I have to put another quantifier. For every x and for every scale k in the natural numbers, there exists a unique standard dyadic interval i such that x is contained in i and the length of i is two to the minus k. If I draw the unit interval and say this is x here, I have one interval of length one that contains x. I have one interval of length one half that contains x, one interval of length one quarter that contains x, standard dyadic intervals, I mean, not arbitrary intervals and so on. For every scale, I just have one standard dyadic interval that contains x. We'll call this interval i sub k of x, the unique interval of length two to the minus k containing x. Then since the half functions h sub i, h sub i of x equals zero if x is not in i because the half functions are supported on these intervals. What you see is that only given x, so for every fixed x here, the only intervals that contribute are those intervals i sub k of x. So we'll have k and n, epsilon i sub k of x, h i sub k of x of x, ha coefficient associated with i sub k of x, like that. So we've taken this sum over all of the dyadic intervals and fixed x and noted, okay, we don't need to sum over all dyadic intervals. We only need one dyadic interval for every scale. This is the key point in this lemma here, because now we look at this Rademacher sum on the inside here, this Rademacher average, 
And by the independence of the choice of writer marker sequence, we can take this sequence here and rewrite it like this. Let's write this epsilon null set as epsilon zero for consistency. Let's write this as epsilon length of i sub k of x. Because the set of <coughs> the only writer marker variables that appear here are the are indexed by i sub k of x. They're indexed by k, basically. So I can just index the writer marker sequence by k, or I can index it by the length of i sub k of x, because that's in bijective correspondence with the set of all k's here. Yeah. Now I do the support argument that I did before, but in the other direction. And I can take back the sum over all dyadic intervals. But now I have writer marker variables indexed by their lengths. It's a subtle argument. It's not a particularly difficult one, but it is a subtle argument. If you compare this line with this line and you see what we've done, we've taken the writer marker average indexed over all dyadic intervals and we've said it's actually the same as the writer marker average indexed over the lengths of the intervals. So we have less randomization, but you get the same thing. And then you get, that's the end of the proof there because then you do the Kahan Kinchin again and you get the, you get this term here. It's all yeah, very confusing when you see it for the first time. But one point with these writer marker averages is that sometimes you have some freedom as to how you actually index them. And this can be useful. Sometimes it's natural to have a, a writer marker variable for every interval. Sometimes it's more natural to have one for every scale. In our case here, I think the scales are going to be more important than the intervals. I don't know if we really needed this full result, but we certainly need this last line here. That being equivalent to the LP norm of F. Okay, let's move on from that. Let's now go back to the real line, back to shifted dyadic systems and look at the consequence of this for the shifted dyadic systems. So we're gonna take this result saying that the LP norm of F, well, I'm at the wrong point. LP norm of F is equivalent to these writer marker averages. This is for the unit interval and for the standard dyadic system. We're gonna get a corresponding result for the real line and all shifted dyadic systems by reducing to this result. Uh, okay, so here's the theorem. If X is UMD, if P is between one and infinity, and if D, we just write D to be T D omega is a generalized dyadic system. I'm going to write D for a generalized dyadic system and just drop the T and the omega because they're pretty much irrelevant most of the time and these all look the same anyway. Then for all F in LP, but now of the real line, not just the unit interval, the LP norm of F is equivalent to the writer marker average over all intervals in the generalized dyadic system, like before, except now we don't have this average term out the front because we're not going to try to average F over the whole real line because we have a two-sided martingale here. Essentially, we're going to get all this telescoping out in the negative scales K in the integers. And this means we don't need this average term out the front. Just remember up here, we had a, a weird looking average term. That's not there anymore. And as before, this is equal to the writer marker average where you just index by scales. Again, there's no average term there. 
So as I said before, if we'd done all of our martingales on general spaces, and if we had two-sided martingales, this would be a consequence of a martingale, like a, a Burkholder inequality, but we didn't do that. So we need to reduce to the probabilistic setting. So we'll just show one of these inequalities. We'll just show this one. We'll just show that the Rademacher right average indexed by scales is bounded by the LP norm of F. All of the remaining inequalities follow by basically the same argument. I think I left that as an exercise in the notes. We just need to do this one. So by a density argument, we can assume F has compact support. Because the compactly supported functions are dense in LP. And this is really just a boundedness result. So it suffices to just consider compactly supported F. And now because F has compact support, there exists a scale J zero in the integers <coughs> such that for all scales J less than J zero, so I need a bit of water. <coughs> okay. There exists a scale J zero such that for all smaller J's, uh, the support of F is covered by two adjacent intervals. Call them ij0, ij1 in d sub j. So these are the dyadic intervals in this generalized dyadic system of length two to the minus j. Why do we need two adjacent intervals? Uh, a good example just happens on with the standard dyadic system. Consider this example here. Here's the real line. Well, what's my template doing? Here's the real line. Here is zero. And so let's look at the standard dyadic system on the real line. Let's look at a function that looks like this. It's a bump function centered at the origin. It's got support on both sides of the origin. And let's suppose its support goes here. So it's supported on this set here. If we take two dyadic intervals like this, well, what's happened now? My tablet's freaking out now, I don't know why. If these are say two dyadic intervals of length one, then their union covers the support of the function. But either one of them by itself won't cover the support of the function, right? If we take a larger scale, um, a small, however you want to think of it, if you take larger intervals, smaller scale, whatever, larger scale, let me draw them properly so that they're twice the length. If we, if we look at larger intervals, we can still cover the support with two of them, but we can't cover the support with one of them just because of the location of these dyadic intervals, right? If I do it at a larger scale still, like that, we still need two of these intervals to cover the support. Because with the standard dyadic system, you don't have any intervals that are centered at the origin. Either their left endpoint is the origin or their right endpoint is the origin. So for this function, you're always going to need at least two intervals to cover the support. And we just have to deal with that. This is okay. The same happens for shifted dyadic systems if the function's supported somewhere else. Anyway. So this is just why we need two adjacent intervals here. Okay, back to the proof. Let's say I sub J is I sub J zero union I sub J one. So it's this union of two intervals of length two to the minus J and it covers the support of F for all sufficiently small J so that the intervals are large. We're gonna fix a J less than or equal to J zero. And we're going to write the Rademacher average that we want to bound. Oops, that's the wrong way around. So 
So this is what we're trying to bound. We're going to take the contribution from large intervals and the contribution from small intervals. We're going to do them separately. Just by using the triangle inequality, we split the sum into two sums. So the first sum will be the sum over k greater than or equal to j. Intervals in d sub k. And these are going to be small intervals and we're only going to look at the ones that intersect i sub j. And because they intersect i sub j and they have a smaller scale, they have to be contained in i sub j by this dyadic dichotomy. And the second term consists of the large intervals. So this is the sum of k less than j. Intervals in d sub k. And these ones will contain i sub j. This is in LP. I've run out of space on the screen. Uh, the reason we can restrict to intervals that are either contained in i sub j or contain i sub j is because f is supported in i sub j. And if you have an interval that doesn't intersect I sub J, then the Haar coefficient here is going to vanish. So you can restrict the intervals that intersect I sub J and then either they contain I sub J or they're contained in I sub J by this dyadic dichotomy. So that's why we can write the sum in this way. So just to reiterate, this is small intervals and this is large intervals. And we control these two terms in different ways. So let's start with the large intervals. And we can do a very crude estimate for the large intervals. It turns out this is quite easy to estimate. Actually, we, I won't write that out again because we're running out of time. The large interval term is less than or equal to the sum of k less than j the sum over sigma being either zero or one. Remember we have these intervals i sub j zero and i sub j one whose union covers a support of f. So we take the half function associated with these two intervals because they're the only ones that contribute to the sum. And we forget about the averaging. We just crudely put the, the norm inside the sums and we forget that we have rather micro averages. They don't actually matter here, it turns out. We use Helder's inequality. We can get, well, actually this isn't even Helder's inequality yet. We have the LP norm of this half function times the norm in X of this vector. Remember this function here, this elementary tensor, this is just a scalar valued function times a single vector that doesn't vary. So the LP norm of that is the LP norm of the function times the norm in X of the vector. And now we use Helder's inequality. So the LP norm of this half function, no Helder needed, is the length of that interval to the one on P minus one on two, because this is an L2 normalized half function. We have this length to the minus one half factor sitting there and it's supported on the, this interval. So you've got that one on P factor there can bound this by the L1 norm of F times the L infinity norm of that half function, which is this length to the minus one half. We're assuming F's in LP, not in L1, but we also have this assumption that F is compactly supported. So F is, in, is compactly supported and it's in LP, so it is in L1 by Holder's inequality again. Uh, we get a factor of two coming from this sigma here. These things all have the same length independent of sigma. So you just get twice the length of the support of F and support of F is contained in IJ zero. One on P, is that one on P? One on P, one on P prime, I think, yep. Times the LP norm of F. So this is Holder's inequality on this term. Run out of time, okay. Sum of k less than j, these terms here give you two to the minus k, one on p minus one. I hear the church bell in the background. So this means I've run out of time. So I'm gonna quickly finish up this proof. This is up to a constant, the measure of this support, 
times the LP norm of F. And this sum just gives you basically two to the J one minus one on P. It's finite. You're taking small K, negative K, but one on P minus one is negative. So you've got basically two to the K as K goes to minus infinity. It's a geometric series. It converges, it's all good. That's the large interval term. I'm gonna very quickly do the small interval term. Small intervals, you're looking, let me just give the summary. The full proof is in the notes and I don't wanna to go too over time. Everything is on the interval I sub J, all right? Uh, you let P sub J be the normalized Lebesgue measure on I sub J so that I sub J is now a probability space. And if you look at this small interval term here, what you're looking at now is one of these hard decompositions on a probability space. It's on a shifted dyadic system, but these look exactly the same as a standard dyadic system. So this is something you can estimate by the previous result. Baha transforms or Baha representations on a probability space on the unit interval. So we just use the unit interval result. We'll just reprove it. It's exactly the same argument. And you get by Burkholder's inequality, this small interval term that I still have to write out. This is bounded by the LP norm of F. Actually, you have to restrict to I sub J, renormalize, do the estimate, and then re-renormalize, and you get what you want. So all up, you get that the Rademacher average, which I won't write out because it takes too long, is controlled by the small interval term plus the large interval term. So you get the LP norm of F times, so the small interval term just has a one, the large interval term has this I sub J zero, one on P prime, two to the J, one minus one on P. And you get this for all J less than or equal to J zero. You let J tend to minus infinity and the second term drops out <laughs> and you're good. And that completes the proof for compactly supported functions. And then you use density to give you the result for all functions because this estimate we got in the end doesn't depend on the support of F. Okay. And that's all I wanted to do for today. So are there any questions? Okay. Oh, on Thursday. The oh, yeah. theorem that you just proved. Yep. What about this? Here's what we just proved. So we've showed basically for generalized dyadic systems, you have this, this Rademacher average characterization of the LP norm. So you have this generalized Haar expansion associated with a generalized dyadic system. And the LP norm of a function can be given by, well, it's what you would actually call a Haar square function. Yeah. So, so how far are we from yeah. treating the Hilbert transform yet? So what we have to do now is we go from these Haar representations to the Haar shift operators. Yes. The operators built out of the Haar systems and the reason they're bound basically boils down to this. Then we will average the Haar shift operators to get averaged Haar shifts and show that these averaged Haar shifts actually are the truncated Hilbert transforms. That's, we're, we're not far off actually. Yeah. Haar shift meaning what? Uh, uh, Haar. The, the I think I'll leave that until Thursday. The definition okay, will take okay, too long. Yeah, I should yeah. not. Yeah, we'll all do it on Thursday. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. yeah, we should get to the Hilbert transform by the end of Thursday, yeah. I think. Unless well, it turns out Hilbert to be exceptionally transform. confusing. Yeah, so mm -hmm. there's the Hilbert transform and then there's, of course, other multipliers or yep. uh, differential operators. Yeah, so next week we're going to go from the Hilbert transform to Michelin multipliers. Right, so yeah. Fourier okay. multipliers with some smoothness assumptions. Yeah. And then yeah. we'll do the Littlewood-Paley theorem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That'll be yeah. next okay, week. Okay, so, so, okay, I'll just be patient. Yeah, I just wanted to get to the point. Uh, 
you know, you, you showed us how the Hilbert transform is identified by its symmetries, which yeah. is, uh, you know, which leads to very slick proofs for the Hilbert transform. Mm. Uh, but then if you do Michelin multipliers, you have to do a little less slick proofs anyways, right? But yeah. you seem to be on the way of doing both. Uh, well, we're going to get Michelin multipliers sort of as superpositions of Hilbert transforms. Uh, That's okay. how we're going to get Michelin, yeah. Uh, Michelin mul uh, Hilbert transforms a Fourier multiplier with symbol that's basically minus one oh. up to zero and then one, and then you can superpose them to get Michelin multipliers. You do what sense. you uh, shift that symbol. Um, yeah, we shift that around. We get indicators, functions yeah, of yeah, intervals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So of course, shifting that will destroy somehow. Uh, yeah. It destroys all the invariances. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, lots of games to be played. <laughs> yeah, right. it's all sort of slick in the end. It's still difficult, but it's yeah. the proofs are relatively slick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Yeah, I look forward to Thursday then. Good. Following. Yeah, great. Thanks. Good. Any other questions? No. Okay, you're um, free to in, go. In the, in the oh. large interval, why do we pass through L1 of F? Do we um, need to? No real reason. Um, <laughs> we just needed something that was, well, where were we? So we were here. We could have gone directly from here to here. With okay. the, and a bit okay. of factor there coming from the half function. The, the key thing was just that we get this series in the end with something that decays in J. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, one more. I think the, the L1 is just psychologically, it worked well for me because I wanted to pull out the L infinity norm of the half function. The thing is, if I just pulled out the LP norm of F and took the LP prime norm of the half function, the estimate doesn't work. The thing doesn't converge anymore. So the fact that F is in LP so isn't enough information. The fact that F is in LP is not enough information for this proof. You'll, you need that F is in LQ for some Q less than P, <laughs> actually, to make the whole thing work. And but because I've took F to be compactly supported, it, it's in L1, that'll do, yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. try doing this just using the LP norm of F and you'll see it doesn't work, yeah. I guess I guess the thing is that F is also, uh, do you hear me, Alex? Yeah, I do, yeah. Ah, oh, sorry. I just want to say that uh, the, the thing is that all F also brings some information on uh, H, so in the sense, the support of F also, yeah, like okay, I mean, uh, no, you're right. I I mean, it, it's not just that F's in LP, but you've also got this support yes. restriction that gives you extra decay. Exactly. Yeah, the amount of decay does depend on the size of the support, but when you take this limit, you've got this parameter J, and when you take that to infinity, all of that dependence vanishes. Yeah, this is the thing. We get a some number here that we don't want, but we have this decay in J, and we're free to take any J we want. So we can make that whole thing vanish. Yeah. Works out fine. Thanks. It's almost cheating. Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. If there are no more questions. Yeah, yeah so one, what, one well, there seem to be more uh, questions. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so there's um, uh, truncations of the Hilbert transform. So yep. you take from epsilon to E, if we restrict from epsilon to one, let's say, we can still do the just the translations and the usual Lebesgue measure on the translations of zero one, right? Uh, yeah. If we just want to work with the truncation from epsilon to one, I mm. guess. Yeah. Is it? Uh, I'm, actually, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. What do so, you so, mean? So, so let's say we we uh, we're like uh, we're working with the Hilbert transform, yep. not from like zero to infinity, but uh, the integral from zero to one. So yeah. we truncate from epsilon to one, and then we want to do this all this dyadic stuff like this, uh, uh, the general dyadic system. Oh yeah, you mean so uh, instead of working on the real line, you work on the torus. Uh, not oh. not on the torus, but uh, uh, the truncation from epsilon. Like we split the truncated Hilbert transform into two parts. Oh so sure, no, I get you now. Yeah, you don't actually. One, yeah, no, you're completely yeah. right. You don't have to look necessarily at epsilon to e. You could look at epsilon to one and one to e, and just consider one of those, and it should all work. I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, and, and, and actually, and just the, thinking of the, proof and the okay. The do, question is that in, yeah. the question is if if in this case we still need to do this uh, the general dyadic system in the way you do, or it's enough to consider the 
uh, the, just the translations and the measure of translations? I think for the small truncation, or for one of the truncations, you're completely right. The other one would get difficult. The other one would need to consider sort of working on the integers or something like that instead of, yeah. I don't know, because I feel like for one of these truncations, it's like you can have a top scale. Yeah, for the, for the smaller like one, that. it's definitely true. But I for the larger that. one, you're going to run into trouble, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I think, yeah. No, so somehow somehow yeah. maybe it would be possible to reverse that because the larger part is still uh, somehow the inverse of the small one. I, th so. the, I think what you can actually do is rather than splitting the truncation at one like you were doing, actually the fact that you're only dealing with truncated Hilbert transforms means I think in the proof you can actually always fix a top scale and work uh -huh. from that. But okay. somehow it's a bit less natural. I don't know. It would work though, I think. It's essentially a technicality. Like, Yeah, well, this is, this is definitely more elegant, but... Uh... Yeah. I mean, you see in this proof that I did here, like this is all about saying you can fix a top scale and you're going to get error terms that vanish as that top scale approaches the whole space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. if you wanted to prove actually that the X valued Hilbert transform is the point wise limit of the truncated Hilbert transforms, you would have to do this argument. We're not going to do it, but that's, uh -huh, it's one thing to show that the Hilbert transform is bounded. It's another thing to show that it exists as a point-wise limit of truncated Hilbert transforms. And it does almost everywhere, but we're not going to prove that. This is getting quite technical, yeah. Well, well, well the, in, the, in the classical case, you, you assume some, I mean, in the classical case, you don't really need it, right? Uh, yeah. You just uh, do it for some smooth subclass and then you know the bound for the maximally truncated one. Uh, yeah, but your arguments in the classical case are very different because you can really use Calderon Zygmunt type arguments, right? Here, like you, you've got the L2 bound on Poincher L for free in the scalar valid case. And then it's a matter of extrapolation of the L2 result to general LP. And you have a lot more techniques for that. But here we have to prove the result directly on LP for every P. Mm -hmm. So we can't just use I was going to say easy methods, but that's the wrong term. Calder and Zygmunt methods are not easy. <laughs> Maybe easier, but they're still not easy. No, but somehow, somehow, if you head for this linear combination of the tensor products, you mm -hmm. know it, you know the pointwise uh, convergence, then you would know it also for the general, uh, for, for the any LP, right? Uh, LDX. You could do it, yeah. You have some technical reductions to make. It's not quite immediate, but it does work, yeah. There's always some technicality in going from the existence of the operator as like an LP limit to a pointwise limit, and you can do it. Yeah, I just didn't. Are, want to are, are, are we going to prove? Uh, are we going to prove the, or that maybe it immediately follows from, from what you do? The max that the maximally truncated uh, one is also bound. I'm not going to do it. No, I, it wouldn't immediately follow. It would follow. Yeah, okay. I wouldn't say immediately. But uh, but it's uh, some kind of adaptation of the of the culture, like the classical uh, the scalar valued case, or. Uh, um, um, to be honest, I'm not sure. I can see that it would work, but I can't say exactly how. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. I'm not sure to be honest. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to go that deep into this question in this course, though. Yeah, I think there's always a question. I mean, there's things you can say on finite models, right? You just take some yeah. finitely many scales, a finite part of yeah. the universe, and then you prove something, things that's, uniform. That's how we're going to do it, actually. Yeah. 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 And then the question is, how do you argue with limits, right? And yeah. it's probably, it's probably not a unique way of doing it. And be. then there's yeah. ways, maybe... I'm not quite sure how much we are doing Banach valued or specifically generally Banach valued here right now. There's probably questions when you do Banach valued about these limits and in what way, I, I'm yeah. not quite sure. Yeah, it, at least for what I know of this area, like for the, just for the Hilbert transform and convergence issues and things like that, it, it's not too difficult and it's not too Banach valued even. It just takes too long and I wanted to get to the other parts of the course. Because we yeah. still have to prove, for example, that boundedness of the Hilbert transform implies the UMV property, the Borgand theorem. And that's going to take another week. <laughs> yeah, this, this, so, this is the harder one, right? That I think is the more important thing for this course. Yeah, 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 yeah.
because that's a legitimately vector valued thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but then you have these, maybe you have different ways of taking limits uh, and then you could consider it. Yeah, you yeah you've got like various way, weak convergence and an art convergence. to look at different ways of doing it, right? Anyway, I did like this, uh, the discussion we had earlier today about this embedding into finite measure space is probably not the unique way of doing it. No, there are other ways for sure. Yeah. yeah. This is, yeah, there's no claim to this being the unique proof. I mean, this isn't even the only dyadic system proof. It's not even the only random dyadic system proof. It's just the one that was written up in analysis and Barnack spaces. In fact, I've modified it slightly, so it's not even that proof. <laughs> it's mostly that proof. Yeah. There are too many proofs. But the key idea is the same. Somehow relate it down to Martingale transforms somehow average them out or something to get the translation invariance, or at least in an approximate way. And the dilation invariance, of course. Yeah. Yep. Every time I ask if there are more questions and I say there's no more questions, somebody <laughs> comes up with a question. So I'm not gonna say it this time, but you're free to go <laughs> if there are no more questions. <laughs>